Ok, my name is Sven Arne Reinemo from Simula Research Laboratory in Norway. I belong to a group uh, called Network Systems, and we work on uh, various topics in high-performance networking, including uh, InfiniBand-related topics. So today I will talk a bit about uh, congestion control. Uh, before we start, I will just give some uh, acknowledgments, especially to Ernst Gunnar Gran, which is the PhD student that did most of the work behind this uh, behind this talk. Also, I would like to mention Gilad Scheine from Mellanox and the HPC Advisory Council, which made this uh, this work possible. So, what are we going to talk today? Uh, we will start with some uh, some background on congestion control and uh, congestion itself. Then we will move on to some measurement results from our tiny cluster. <coughs> and then we also have some simulation results for uh, a larger topology. And then we have a summary and some, some information about our ongoing results as well. <coughs> so, what is uh, congestion? If you look at this, uh, this small topology, which consists of seven, seven hosts and two switches, if we add, uh, add some flows to this topology, then we, in this way we will have a hot receiver, host 5, and we have host 2, 6, and 7 sending traffic to this host at, um, at full speed. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and this will create, uh, this will saturate the link towards host 5 and due to the lossless operation of uh, InfiniBand lead to back pressure towards host to switch 2 and this will start the build up, build up of a congestion 3. So ba basically the queues are filled up in the switches and uh, the flow control leads to back pressure all the way from the destination towards uh, all the sources. And this is, uh, this is normal, so, so the situation we have right now is that the link towards H5 is saturated and all the other hosts accessing host 5 are getting one third of the link bandwidth each. And this is, this is the best we can do in this uh, situation. If you now add a, a so-called victim flow between host 1 and host 4, uh, this flow will, without congestion control, be a victim of head-of-line blocking. Basically, this means that from switch 1, this flow will uh, hit into the same congestion tree as the three flows accessing host 5, leading to back pressure also towards host 1. And the, the negative effect that this has on ho the flow between host 1 and host 4 is that the link rate for this flow is reduced to the same speed as host 2 accesses the link towards host 5. So basically, uh, when packets are leaving this switch, uh, host 1 ca packets cannot escape any faster than host 2 packets because it's, it's blocking them in the queue. That's the, that's the head of line blocking. So, uh, Using congestion control, we can avoid this. And InfiniBand congestion control uses a closed-loop closed -loop feedback system uh, in order to remove the congestion tree and thereby avoid the, the head-of-line blocking. Uh, so what, let's follow the situation in, uh, in a network where InfiniBand congestion control now is activated. A packet uh, leaves from host 2 towards host 5. When this packet receives uh, switch 2, which contains the root of the congestion tree, then uh, the congestion control mechanism will uh, mark this packet with a forward explicit congestion notification. Bit is actually set in the, in the packet header. <coughs> and then the packet is, uh, continues to watch host 5, and when it rece is received at host 5, uh, this uh, second bit is observed, and this leads to the creation of a backward explicit congestion notification which is sent back to the, the source of the packet, telling the, the source that uh, this packet was congested during its uh, travel towards host 5. And when it receives this, uh, this backend, this is a sign telling host 2 that it needs to reduce 
its uh, injection rate into the network. And this is done by modifying a, a index into a congestion control table which contains acceptable uh, injection rates for this host. So when it achieves one beacon, it, uh, it reduces its injection rate by one step and so on as more beckons are received. And this continues until, uh, until host two has throttled its, uh, its injection rate enough to remove the congestion tree in the network. And this, this is the basic principle in order to avoid, uh, avoid congestion trees and thereby letting host uh, one, the flow between host one and host four have full access to, to its uh, network resources. <coughs> the settings for, for infinite congestion control is, uh, is already specified in the standard. Many of you probably know, that, know about that already. Uh, some of them are related, related to the host. The most important are uh, the congestion control table and the uh, timer. At the switch side, we have the threshold, the marking rate, and the packet size, which governs how congestion are triggered in the switches. Basically, it's, it uh, looks at the switches, uh, the queues in the switches, and how the fill rate of the queues, and decides if uh, one should consider uh, a switch or a port congested or not. Uh, so that's the, the basic theory behind it. <coughs> now let's take this into the lab and see, see what happens. This is the cluster that we have, or can't hardly call it a cluster, but that, this is the equipment that we have uh, in our lab. It consists of uh, seven hosts again and uh, two switches. The switches are QDR capable and the hosts are connected with uh, DDR links to the two switches. But the link in between here is a QDR, it's 40 gigabits. So basically have a lot of bandwidth here. But we will see that this uh, bandwidth doesn't really help uh, improving the congestion problem. <coughs> As before, let's uh, add a flow. We start with a victim flow this uh, time. Uh, and when we add this flow between host 1 and host uh, 4, it achieves approximately 13 gigabits of uh, throughput, which is what we can expect with, um, with this configuration or the equipment that we have. Let's add another flow towards host five, and this is going to be the congested flows, and host five will be the hot receiver. <coughs> but for now, everything is uh, perfectly fine, as we have enough bandwidth between the two switches. Both host one and host two see uh, throughput at the level of, um, um, at, at full, full link capacity. If we continue, to add another flow from host 3 to host 5. <coughs> then we have a situation where uh, uh, the two hosts need to share the link uh, bandwidth towards host 5 and this link is uh, saturated because the switch to switch link again is, is faster. <coughs> and the effect is that we see a drop in performance, not just for the congested flows but also for the victim. So the victim uh, or f let's the, the um, contributors to congestion have to share the link bandwidth towards host 5 and they get 50% each and that means that uh, the victim flow in switch 1 is unable to access this link any faster than the slowest uh, of these two which reduces the victim flow's throughput to 50% as well. As we, as we see in the chart. If we continue with another flow from H6 to H5, we see a further reduction in throughput for, the, for all the flows on the left side. But we see that the flow on the right side gets uh, twice the performance. And that is it's not really re related to congestion, it's related to something called the parking lot problem. And this flow gets uh, a bigger share of the link because it's located closer to the destination. So in this switch, uh, these two flows are arbitrated uh, as one in the switch, meaning that they get, they have to share 50% of the bandwidth, while this link, link take the other 50% towards uh, host five. So it's, it's not really related to head of line blocking, but uh, we can see some inter interesting effects of congestion control there as well a bit later. Let's add uh, a final flow, and we see that the same uh, situation continues, and 
throughput is, uh, is further reduced. So basically, congestion kills the performance for the victim flow, which should be able to achieve uh, full link speed towards host 5 because this, uh, uh, this link has uh, 40 gigabits uh, capacity. So how does this look if we add, uh, do the same scenario but activate InfiniBand congestion control? We have the, the previous results here on the left. Then we repeat the process, add the victim flow. Everything looks fine. Then we add the first congested flow, and as before, everything looks fine. And then we add <coughs> the second congested flow. And we see that everything is working <coughs> as uh, expected. The victim flow is now able to access uh, these resources, these links, at full speed, and is unaffected by the congested flows. And we see that uh, if you add another flow, which introduced or made the parking lot problem visible in the, in the previous, previous results here, we see now that they are, all three flows are on the same level. And that's because the congestion control, when it rate limits all the, the sources, it introduces fairness between the con contributed flows. So the parking lot effect is no longer uh, uh, affecting the performance of the network. So that's, that's, a, that's a second benefit of uh, using congestion control. <coughs> and if you add more flow, flows, we see the same behavior again. <coughs> So basically, this shows that uh, congestion control works, at least in this very simple scenario. Um, and of course, in order to make it work, we need to have a proper configuration. And that's part of the challenge using, uh, using congestion control. It uh, took uh, quite a bit of trial and error for us to, to reach this uh, working set of parameters. Uh, also, in order to just visualize the, the results in a different manner, we replaced the victim flow, which was in the previous scenario, just was a, was a perf test flow flooding the network, and replaced the, <coughs> the, the flow on these two nodes, host one and host four, with uh, the HPCC benchmark. And then we see that they all gain a lot when congestion control is, is activated, as shown here in the rightmost column the percentage gain. And of course, uh, the amount of gain is related to the level of communication going on for the various uh, type of benchmarks. Again, it's a simple test and it's a very small scenario, but it serves to show that uh, there are uh, improvements to be gained here. Uh, one problem, as I said, was to find the proper configuration for uh, congestion control. And in order to study this further, we looked at the throughput of the victim flow, the flow, the flow between host 1 and host uh, uh, 4, with a different set of uh, values for the marking rate and the CC timer parameters. And this plot shows that uh, in, in the yellow area here, the victim flow is, is close, close to optimal performance. But in this part, orange and uh, purple, then, then performance is degrading. And this is related mostly to the timer, and the marking rate doesn't really seem to count that much. So, uh, so the main result here is that the timer needs to be high enough <coughs> for the victim flow to see a benefit of congestion control. And that this is related to how the timer affects the contributors to congestion. If they doesn't slow down enough, then they will keep maintain the congestion tree in the network and thereby not removing congestion. So they need to be, the timer must be high enough so they keep, uh, keep quiet for a long enough time to the congestion tree to be removed. So that's uh, one, the, the key observation to take away from this uh, slide. Uh, similarly, we can look at uh, the throughput for, the combined throughput for all the contributors to congestion. And then we have uh, the same parameters. And again, we see that everything works best 
when the timer is uh, at the lower edge of the scale, when it gets it's very high, up, you know, four or five thousand, then we start to see, see a degradation. Uh, but uh, we can't really say anything from this slide about how the uh, these parameters affect the stability of the network when more congested flows are added. So we had to, to dig a little deeper, <coughs> and uh, this this uh, motivates this uh, this digging. If the timer is uh, badly configured, we will end up with a very slow convergent process for for the various uh, congested flows. Remember the previous slide? We saw that it was fairly quick to stabilize on a, on a straight line, but here is very much oscillation. And it hardly stabilized before there's another flow added. <coughs> so in order to, to, to find, try to find the area where uh, the good values are for, for the marking rate and the, and the timer, we just made uh, collected the delta values of the high and low for each of the contributors' flow and made something called the treatment variation variable, which basically is the variance of the high and low value between the high and low values of the uh, contributing flows. And then we plot this. And then we see that uh, <coughs> there are a lot of values in this plot, the orange area over here, which is uh, I won't say useless, but they are much, much worse than the one you find down here, where you have the lowest variation, meaning that you have the, the area where the contributing flows are stabilizing uh, quickly. And if you look, uh, it's hard to see from the figure, but if you look at the numbers behind this, the best values seem to be found uh, approximately around this uh, or inside this, uh, this circle. And within that circle, we will also find these parameters, which is the ones that we ended up with uh, using for our test uh, and the results presented uh, previously. Uh, and these values, or the, the, the parameter study was performed after we have found these values. So uh, it's just under, <coughs> it shows that uh, we did hit the sweet spot just by trial and error. But for larger topologies, this could, of course, be, um, be a challenge to find this area. Uh, so in order to study a bigger scenario, as we don't have any big cluster, don't have much hardware, we had to, to go to simulations. And we built a simulation model of the congestion control mechanism in InfiniBand in uh, something called Omnet, which is an open source platform for uh, network simulations. Uh, we did, uh, just to validate the performance of the simulation tool, we repeated the previous experiment. What we see here is the hardware results from before. And in simulations, it looks quite similar. The simulation is slightly more efficient when it comes to the contributing flows, but uh, we seem to have uh, catched the behavior of the InfiniBand congestion control uh, algorithm. And just to make clear, this figure, it's emulate a generic switch as well as uh, the InfiniBand congestion control mechanism, uh, not the specific uh, Mellanox hardware that I've used in the test, because we don't know any details about what's inside the hardware, how the switches are configured, etc. So, so we, it's kind of a black box uh, simulation, but we know, we know, you know the, the overall behavior of things. So then we moved on to a bigger topology. Uh, this is a 648-port uh, FAT tree, which is the biggest uh, two-level FAT tree you can build using 36-port uh, switches. And in this, <coughs> this topology, we had a slightly different traffic pattern. We had 20% of the nodes. It's, it's still very synthetic, but then it's more predictable in order to, to evaluate what happens. 20% uh, of the nodes send traffic to any form, anyone in the network uniformly. And uh, the average throughput per node, or the average receive rate for, uh, <coughs> for each node, when only these 20% of the nodes are active, is approximately 2 gigabits. Then there is no hotspots and no congestion control activated. Then we add eight hotspots in the network, or eight hot receivers. 
<laughs> and 80 plus, the remaining 80% of the nodes send traffic to these uh, these hotspots. So it's a uh, you know heavily congested uh, congested network. And the, the result then is that the hot uh, the hot receivers receive approximately 13 gigabits of throughput because they are saturated. So that's as expected. Uh, but the victim flows, or the remaining 20% 20, 20 of flows sending uniform traffic, are heavily uh, have to have a pay a price, and you see there is almost no throughput for these flows. And it, no, it's a scenario with hotspots, but there is no congestion control uh, activated. And then we add congestion control, and we see that the, the hotspots are slightly reduced. And we don't really see any improvement, even with congestion control. So why is that? Well, that's basically because the parameters that we used here were, were not the proper ones. They were not correct. Uh, the parameters used here is the same as used for the small cluster uh, presented earlier. So what we had to do then was to, to start tuning again. We had a new topology, bigger topology. We need to find a new set of parameters in order to make this uh, work. And then after some tuning, we ended up with this. We have improved the hotspot uh, receive rate, and we also improved the, the, the victim receive rate about, I think it's about 20, 20 times or something like that. But in this, in this scenario, the congestion control mechanism is working on a virtual lane basis, meaning that all traffic on a given virtual lane is affected by congestion control and backends. Uh, and since we're only using one virtual lane, that means all traffic. If we move this to the Cooper level, so only, only traffic on the same Cooper are affected by the congestion control, then we see a further improvement. And now we are talking about a 40, 40 times uh, improvement for the for the victim flows, and also maybe a slight reduction for the hotspots, but it's still very close to, to, to the maximum. So, so we can make it work, but then again we had to do some more, uh, more tuning. <coughs> and finally just uh, the scenario with out hotspots but with congestion control shows that there is a slight penalty turning on congestion control in the case where there is, where is no congestion. But it, uh, in most cases it would be worth it as the improvement uh, when there are hotspots in the network uh, is so large. So, uh, the to just the total network throughput for the same scenario, and we see that it's, it's uh, reduced with hotspot and without congestion control. It grows a bit, but uh, not much. We do some proper tuning, it grows even further, and then we add the keepers, and then we are really talking about uh, a good, uh, good utilization of the network again. So we are getting good utilization, even in the case of uh, hotspots. And this shows the penalty again of in total network throughput. throughput. And there is, uh, there is a slight penalty, but if you have hotspots from time to time, it's probably worth it. So that's, uh, that's the current state of, uh, of our research. We are still uh, working on uh, very synthetic traffic patterns. We would like to, to move on to more uh, advanced traffic patterns later. We are working on the proper tools to, to use traces, etc., in order to, to do this more realistically. Uh, we would also like to consider other topologies as well. Uh, but this is more or less the current state. So let me just summarize. Infinite man congestion control seems to work very well. Uh, it removes the negative effects of head-of-line blocking. As a bonus, it also removes uh, the parking lot problem, and it has uh, only a negligible uh, penalty on, uh, on the traffic when there is no hotspots uh, in the network. But it must be properly configured, and it can be time-consuming to find this uh, configuration. And it's also not very well understood uh, how to, to approach this. So that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult task. And also, at least in, in our opinion, it's, it's uh, difficult to know under which scenarios, uh, real-world scenarios, uh, congestion control is, uh, is beneficial. But that's something we'd like to, to study further, and if any of you has some good, uh, good ideas or experiences, then we would be glad to hear from you. Uh, we are, of course, continuing our congestion control research, and our first step is trying to find some kind of guidelines or heuristics in order to, 
to, to make it easier to configure congestion control for a given topology, and if you can, for a given topology, find a set of guidelines that works. Are they valid for this topology with any type of application? Or are it very sensitive to the application as well? And then you have an even more difficult situation because you have to, to tune the parameters just not to the topology, but also to the application. But this, this remains to be seen. Uh, we are also looking into, as a research lab, we are looking into extensions, modifications, how we can improve on this, uh, on the mechanism as well. And as I said, the more uh, better traces. If anyone are interested in all the details, there are several papers that is available. Uh, you can get them from me, or they are probably available on the net as well, most of them. And um, just let me know. So that's all. Uh, start with you. Um, it sounds like you're looking for uh, some uh, optimal or a relatively optimal static values, but is there any work going on in the world trying to go automatically or by the not that I'm aware of, but of course that's something you consider as well, but that's more, uh, it's even further ahead. But it's, it's an interesting thought to have the network itself trying to discover these values and, uh, and reconfigure itself automatically. I think uh, you in the back was next. So the parameters okay. that you were tweaking to get this right, these were the, the CCT timers and such, or were you also playing with MPI compared? Only the, the CCT parameters. And, uh, so the, and your paper doesn't talk in detail about yeah, it gives details about the parameters and, and what we have been uh, tweaking on. Thank you. Have you considered uh, simulating uh, specifically in your factory uh, simulations where you have an abundant uh, of active diversity? Uh, in the adaptive Sorry, I <laughs> could you repeat that? Have you considered adaptive routing in the simulations? Uh, not in in those simulations. It's it's uh, classical static routing. So that's also something we would look into in the, in the future when we have adaptive routing and the combination. How does that? Is it an improvement? Is it another problem? And uh, what does it look like? Um, what tools did you use to change the parameters? Are there open source tools? Did you write them? Did you use Melanox? Well, at the time we, we received some tools from uh, Melanox when I did this. Uh, but I don't know what's, what's the plan for, uh, for doing this when it's in, in production.